Good morning. That was a nice touch, singing part of that song in Spanish. I only knew what it said because of the English words, and I think I've told you this before, that um, Spanish is the most beautiful language in the world. I can't speak it at all, and uh, it's not going to be spoken in heaven. <laughs> I can tell you for sure the language in heaven is going to be English. And you know why? It's because Americans won't learn any other language. <laughs> no, it's probably going to be Hebrew or something or whatever. God's going to give us the gift of tongues anyway when we, when we get to heaven. I want to um, welcome our online viewers uh, that are watching our streaming video at this time. And later um, in the week on cable, welcome to our service. Welcome as we've been praising God and as we hear his word today. In my message last week, I made a statement that was not in my notes. I said that if good works will not get you into heaven, then bad works will not keep you out of heaven. And I got an email later that afternoon that shows there was at least one person listening, questioning that, and they wrote partly in that email, it says, Today in your sermon you said that a person cannot be lost by their works, yet I cannot seem to think of a way to justify such a conclusion. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. And then that individual listed some other Bible passages as well. And this is an excellent question, and it, it, it shows how poorly we preachers, pastors, ministers, have explained the basis of why God takes us to heaven. And especially in the Adventist church, there's been so much emphasis on behavior. And don't misunderstand me as we go through this message. Behavior is very important. But we have to understand what the place of behavior is and why we behave and why we don't, uh, don't behave. And this individual could have cited one of the passages in 1 Corinthians, the book that we're going through, during the five weeks of, uh, of my message, the Jesus only, comma, or series. And this, um, mess this verse is in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. And I'm reading from the worldwide English New Testament. And Paul says this, Do you not know that bad people will have no part in the kingdom where God rules? Do not be fooled. There are some people who will not have a part in that place. They are those who commit adultery of any kind, those who have idols or steal, always, or are always wanting more, or talk wrong things about people, or drink plenty of strong drink, or take things by force, or curse. Now that seems pretty clear, doesn't it? Paul starts off by saying, Do you not know that bad people will have no part in the kingdom of of God. So I must have spoken incorrectly against the Bible when I said bad behavior will not keep you out of heaven. And then in the next verse, Paul drives his point home. He says, some of you, verse 11, some of you were like that, the list that we were just reading, which is only a partial list, but now you have been washed and made holy. The Spirit of our God has made you right by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I hope I have your attention by now. And out of the 10 years that I've been preaching at New Hope, this could well be the most important sermon that I will have preached in those 10 years. Because in my ministry, as I have counseled and worked with people, the bottom line every time with so many people is that they're unsure whether God has truly accepted them. And out of that uncertainty, out of that insecurity, all kinds of additional issues and problems occurs. And I'm going to read this next part from my notes because I didn't want to miss it, and I don't want you to miss it, and I don't normally read my sermons. But I want you to catch the point of, of what happens when we don't understand this issue of the relationship of our behavior to whether we have eternal life or not. The subject concerning who goes to heaven and who does not confuses many people, even to the extent, and listen carefully, they continually have affairs, divorce and remarry, flit from job to job, 
go from treatment center to treatment center, engage in physical and verbal abuse, and the list could go on. And the core issue, and you've heard me preach this over and over again, but it's like a broken record. It doesn't get through with so many of us. The core issue in all of this is the issue of acceptance. And I preached this last week, and I'll be preaching this all my life, is that you and I, desperately in this room today, want to be loved for who we are. Not what someone else thinks we should be. Not because we're nice and do good things. We want to be loved and accepted just as we are. And when we don't feel that way, then we engage in all other kinds of behaviors that we hope will bring that acceptance that we are looking for. Last week I spoke on how Adam and Eve assumed that God would instantly reject them when they took the fruit from the tree of knowledge of evil. They didn't ask God. They, they immediately just assumed that because they had done wrong, they were now rejected and God didn't, wouldn't accept them. And let me read again from my notes. Sin at its core is my attempt to take care of myself because I do not believe that anyone else can truly do so, not even God. Let me read that again. As I've puzzled and worked with people myself and my own relationship to God, let me read this sentence again. Sin at its core is my attempt to take care of myself because I do not believe that anyone else can truly do so, not even God. Why do we build emotional walls to protect ourselves? Why do we criticize others to draw attention away from ourselves? Why do we keep repeating behaviors even when we know they will harm us, such as using drugs because we look to the short-term benefits which they bring and not the long-term harm? Sin at first is pleasurable. That's why we sin. We enjoy it. It's wonderful. It's lovely. But then a stick, sting comes. And we recover at times from that, and then we go back again because we're in this desperate search for who we truly are. And when we don't feel loved, when we don't feel accepted, we'll do anything, even if it harms us in the end, we will still do it because we don't believe anyone else can truly take care of ourselves. Therefore, I've got to do it for myself. Remember last week, we were astonished that Paul could write to the believers in Corinth Right at the beginning of his book, in chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Those sanctified in Christ Jesus, not those who will be sanctified or will one day, he's writing to them as already so. He says, Those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. And yet Paul was realistic about the spiritual maturity of the believers there in Corinth. He had had letters from the household of Chloe. He had insight. He knew there were deep problems. It was one of the most dysfunctional, problematic churches in all the new Christendom that was taking place at that time. And so he could write in chapter 3, he says, starting with verse 1, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you're still controlled by your sinful nature. You're jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. And he's just talked about the factions, some following Apollos, Peter, Paul, and so on. Doesn't that prove you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world when one of you says, I'm a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos? Aren't you acting just like people in the world? After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We're only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work that God gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts. Apollos watered it but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow and the one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose and both will be rewarded for their own hard work for we are both God's workers and you are God's field and you are God's building. 
Paul is very clear that the real issue in this church is not their behavior so much as their immaturity. He likens them to what? Babies. You know, babies are wonderful people. I have a new granddaughter. She'll soon be three months old, just starting to smile. She's cute. She's lovely, except when she cries and doesn't want to stop crying. And my daughter tells me to pick her up and walk around the room, and then she will stop crying. And she poops in her diaper far too often for my liking. And <laughs> I sometimes have to change that diaper, and I, I do, and clean her up. She's very immature. But you know, no one gets upset with her. No one says you shouldn't poop or you shouldn't cry. Why? Why? Because we recognize they're a baby. And Paul is using that same analogy in the church. The reason that people mess up and the reason we have problems is a lot of us are spiritual babies, but we get very upset with those spiritual babies and we talk to them as if they shouldn't be messing up. Well, why don't we treat them the same way as the physical babies? Recognize they're on a journey with Jesus and we're all at different levels on that maturity with Jesus. Paul isn't saying that babies are lost. He's saying they're immature. But immaturity is not an excuse because the baby, as it grows, will become mature. And the Christian is supposed to grow up to be like Jesus. The Christian is supposed to grow up to be an overcomer of sin. The Christian is supposed to grow up and exhibit the fruit of the Spirit and the behavior of Jesus. Now let's look at the next part of this chapter, continuing with verse 10, because it deals very much with this issue of our behavior, whether it gets us into heaven or whether it keeps us out of heaven. Paul now is saying, starting with verse 9, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ by the title of the series, Jesus Only. And what's the or? Because we like to put other things in besides Jesus Only. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Now listen to that very carefully. Paul is saying some of us have great behaviors like gold and silver. When the fire tests it, there's still gold and silver there. But some of us have behaviors like wood and straw and hay that when the fire comes, they will all be burned up. But whether we have the work that stays or the work that's not burned up or the work that's burned up, what is Paul saying here? He says, the builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. What Paul is saying here, and I want you to listen to me very carefully and don't judge me before I finish my whole message, some of us are just going to squeak into heaven. Some of us are just going to squeeze into heaven. When we get there, we're going to be so happy and wonderful. Others will march in triumphant, and they can talk about the thousand people they converted. They're the Enoch's and the Elijah's. But some of us are just going to be thankful to ever have got to be in there. We don't have much to show, because part of the reason is that we remain spiritually immature. It's like a child that's born that's retarded. He or she is still a member of the human race. Parents still love them. They can engage in a certain amount, but they'll never fulfill their full potential because they're retarded. They're a retarded Christian. Now, that's not to make an excuse and say, the reason I can't overcome this sin is because I'm retarded. <laughs> retarded people don't know they're retarded, okay? They just know where, where they are. 
But I want you to hear me very clearly in this, in this message that I'm trying to get across to you, and I hope it will become clearer as, as I go through, that we are all at different levels in this spiritual maturity. And just like some babies are three months old, nine months old, 15, 24, there are Christians who are three months old, eight months old, six years old, and so on. But they're still members of God's family. Just like the one-day-old baby is just as much human as the 26-year-old adult. The one-day Christian is just as saved as the 35-year saint, saint. Hear me out. What we have to understand is that there are two basic meanings of sin. Because you're probably saying, Pastor Newman, you still haven't explained that list yet. Paul was very clear that those behaviors are going to keep us out of heaven. What isn't clear to many people is that sin exists on two levels. Sin exists on the relational level and on the behavioral level. And as Adventists and as Christians, we often talk about the behavioral level much more than the relational level. What do I mean about that? Let's look at some texts that might make this a little clearer. In James 4.17, we read this. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do, and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Did you catch what James just said? We can sin by not doing something. Sin is more than just doing wrong things. Sin is not doing good things. You're driving in your car. I see them all the time. You come up to the street light and there's a guy saying out of work who will work for pay and he's got a little cup and he wants you to give him some money. And the Holy Spirit prompts you, ah, no, they're going to waste on alcohol, and you move on. What James is saying, that you've just sinned because you haven't done some good for that person. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just using that as an illustration that James is saying that we are sinners when we don't do good things as well as when we are doing bad things. In Romans 14, oh, just before I get to Romans 14, so sin can be not doing something as well as doing something wrong. In Romans 14, where Paul is discussing um, eating and whether you're vegetarian or not a vegetarian, whether you're drinking or not drinking and so on, dealing the whole area of, of diet, he gets down to verse 23 and he says, whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is what? Sin. Everything that does not come from faith is sin. If we're thinking of sin as simply not doing a list of behaviors, we're going to be in great trouble before God because how do we define, how do we measure the amount of sin that we're doing when we don't have the kind of faith that we have or we don't have the mature kind of faith that we have? And when God looks down upon us and when he judges us, I grew up with the concept that God was in heaven marking every sin that I committed. And he had this great big book. And I was very much in fear of the judgment because I was told, unless you confess every sin, and I thought, what if I forget some sins? Well, God will bring them back, you know, to your remembrance. And I lived under this fear of judgment and, and behavior. And what I didn't understand and what my parents did not relate to me correctly was that what God wants is not just doing the right thing, he wants a personal relationship with the person that he created. Just as Adam and Eve used to walk with God in the Garden of Eden, and they would talk with him face to face, but when they took that fruit, they immediately assumed that God was going to reject them, that God wasn't going to love them anymore, that God wasn't going to visit with them. And when God came to visit with them, what did they do? They hid. They hid from their creator. And their creator still loved them. He still wanted to be with them. He still wanted to talk with them. He hadn't rejected them because they had had this wrong, wrong behavior. You see, it's not a question of how good we are. If we're kept out of heaven by bad behavior, sins, then no one's going to make it to heaven. No one's going to make it to heaven. And we tend to grade sin. And we say, oh yeah, the adulterer isn't going to do it, and the murderer isn't, and so on. But God isn't grading sin. Sin is sin. One sin, unrepented of, will, will keep us out of heaven. And God is not looking at that. He's looking for something far deeper. 
And the sin that separates us from God is the sin of rebellion against God. See, there's only two groups of people in the world. They're either people for God or people indifferent to God. There's no middle ground. There's no people in between. There's only two groups. You've either made a decision. I want to have a relationship with the God of the universe. I want to know this God. I don't know him very well, but I, I trust that he loves me and I want to have a relationship with him. Or we have a group of people that say, I don't care, or I don't want a God, or he's not a good God. And so what God is looking for at the very basis is he's not looking at our behavior per se. He's first of all looking at our heart and mind and will and saying, do you want to follow me? Do you want to walk with me in the garden? Do you want to look me in the eyes? Do you want to have a personal relationship with me? Are you sorry for your life? Are you sorry for the things that you've done wrong? Do you want to do better? Do you want to be like me? And if that's the case, God says, you're my child. You're in. I love you. And we can move back. We can reject him. We can say, God, I don't want to follow you anymore. And God doesn't force us and says, all right, you're out. You're not going to be in, in heaven. Because what God wants in heaven is people who are in love with him. People who want to follow him all the way. See, in 1 John 1, 8, John reminds us, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. There's some in the Adventist church that believe we've got to reach the place of being sinless before Jesus comes, but you won't find that in Scripture. Right here, it's very clear. If we, say, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. And then Paul in the book of Romans explains how Abraham was saved. And Abraham is the prototype. He's the example. He's the way to illustrate how God saves us. And in Romans 4 verse 13 we read, Clearly, God's promises to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. I don't think you can have it any clearer than that. No matter what translation, this is the New Living Translation, no matter what translation you read, Paul is saying, we're not saved by our good behavior, which means we cannot be lost by our bad behavior. We are saved or lost whether we have a right relationship with God that comes by faith. And I'll prove that more clearly in a moment. Let's take marriage as an example. Some of you are married, some of you have been married, some of you are hoping to get married, and some of you are wondering whether you should get married. So we'll just use marriage as an example. Two people fall in love. They care for each other, but they're not perfect. Uh, they mess up, and when I do my premarital counseling, one of the questions I ask people is, how perfect do you want your spouse to be? And what level of imperfection can you live with? Because there's going to be imperfection. And if you enter marriage thinking that everything's going to be solved and you've got the perfect person, you're going to be soon disillusioned. Soon disillusioned. And Peter, writing to the church in 1 Peter 4, 8, says this, and it's an eschatological text, it's an end time text, it's a very important text for us today. Verse 7, he starts off, the end of the world is coming soon. Peter lived in the, in the viewpoint that Jesus was returning in his day. He says, therefore be earnest and disciplined in your prayers, and then most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers what? A multitude of sins. Now, a lot of Adventists hate that text. So we're supposed to get rid of sin. Can't have sin in the camp. Can't have Achans in the camp and so on. I've heard all these messages. And that's because we have this behavioral description of sin and have forgotten that there's a relational foundation to what we're talking about in sin. And when, when Peter is saying that love covers over a multitude of sins, he's saying that if I'm looking for the imperfections in everyone, I'm always going to be unhappy. I'm always going to have problems because... There'll always be another one to find. And if we truly love each other, those things don't bother us anymore. And when God loves us through Jesus, when we do things wrong, they don't bother him. Just in a marriage. Because he knows the motivation of why we are doing what we are doing. Now, behavior is important. Before some of you shout at me all the other texts, 1 John 5, 2 says, we know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. But in a marriage, 
when the husband does what the wife wants and the wife does what the husband wants, why do they do it? Why? Because they have to? No, because why? They love each other. And when you love someone, it's not a duty, it's not a hardship to do something for the other person. And when love goes, when I do marriage counseling, that's the first question I ask, do you still love each other? And if one says no, my heart drops. There's no motivation for me to work with. Love is the motivation that causes us to do the things that we do that will please and help the other, other person. And Paul makes this even clearer in 1 Corinthians 13, which we'll be spending a whole sermon on later in this series. And he makes a wonderful point, 1 Corinthians 13, 1. He says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I'd only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, that's a lot of faith, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. What is Paul saying here? What he's saying is you can have the perfect person. You can have the model Christian giving their tithe and their offerings and teaching Sabbath school and witnessing to others and doing everything right. And they aren't going to make it to heaven because they're not doing it out of a deep impulse of love for God and for others. And then you've got the people messed up all the time and doing all terrible things and they won't make it to heaven either if they don't love God. So whether you're doing all the right behaviors or whether you're doing all the wrong behaviors, you're still not going to make it to heaven according to what Paul says because you've not dealt with the bottom issue which is a relationship with our Creator, our Jesus, our God. And when we have that relationship, there comes a joy and a desire to be obedient, to grow, to overcome, just as there is in a marriage when two people love each other and care for each other. It takes two people to keep the relationship strong. When I mess up in my marriage, I say to Phyllis, I'm sorry. And you know what she does? She says, I forgive you. And those are some of the most wonderful words. And sometimes I'll mess up again in the same way, and I ask her to forgive me, and she forgives me, and vice versa. We know we're going to mess up, but then we recognize it, and we're sorry, and we work to change our ways. But if one of us stops loving the other, Pretty soon that relationship is going to deteriorate and deteriorate until it can't work anymore. Because while love is unconditional, it takes two to keep a relationship going. Now, if my partner is being unfaithful and not caring, I have two options. I can continue loving them and loving them and, and try and keep them in the relationship, or I can finally say, I still love you, but there are consequences to your behavior it seems you don't really love me and we're going to have to separate and maybe we're going to have to divorce. And God, when he's looking at us and looking at our behavior and when we're dysfunctional, it may be simply because we're baby Christians. But it may be because we don't have that love for God anymore. And so God is looking at the motivation, not at the, at the behavior Last week I showed you two pictures from early Adventism. Here they are again. This was the James White picture. No, no, please go back to the first one. That's a picture of behavior. Because what is prominent in that picture? The law tree, the commandments. Jesus is there, but the dominant motif, you've got to keep the law, you've got to keep the Sabbath. That was early Adventism. The behavior of the seventh day was so important. That's a behavior picture. Now go to the next one. Ellen White revised the picture in 1883, and what is that? That's a relationship picture. 
And what she's talking about and what the Bible is talking about, that the relationship picture is what God wants from us. Now, there's still all the other elements of the first picture. There's still behavior in that picture. Don't misunderstand me. It's not an either or. It's a both and. But the foundation, the reason, the motivation why we do what we do is because we love God and we know he loves us and we've accepted him. And if that isn't the motivation, then it doesn't matter how many good works we do or how many bad works we do, we're not going to get into heaven. And Adventism has struggled understanding that second picture. Adventism has struggled and struggled to make Jesus the center and not the doctrines and not the Sabbaths. We want to be known as a peculiar people. Yeah, we're so peculiar sometimes that no one wants to really have much to do with us because we're unloving, we're unkind, we're impatient because Jesus is not the center of, of our lives. Do you know this Jesus? Do you know my Jesus? I thought last week was the only week I'd do this. You see, it's so easy to be distant with a set of rules. It's so easy to be distant with behaviors. But when you want to enter into a relationship, your emotions have to come into play. Your whole being has to come into play and you start this walk and it's not finished till Jesus comes and yes we stumble on that walk and we will fall on that work and we'll look at ourselves and doubt ourselves and that's why I, I want to read uh, something from um, Ellen White um, and we're back to this list but let me read something from Ellen White who who put that picture up there in the book steps to Christ she says on page 57 she says the character is revealed can we have it up? It's so important. I want you to see that. The character is revealed not by occasional good deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and acts. God is looking at the direction our life is going. Are we on this journey? If we stopped, we're in trouble. But as long as we're moving, maturing, growing, that's all that God asks for because we're in a relationship with him. And his love and his grace covers us and God sees us as perfect at every stage of that journey, just like I see my granddaughter as a p perfect person. Yes, she's immature. Yes, she's messing up. But she's part of the human race. We love her. And God looks us in our immaturities. And sometimes he has to treat us as Paul did with children and only feed us milk. We're not ready for solid food yet. But he still loves us. And then later on in that same chapter, let me read again from Ellen White, because it describes so completely the challenges many of us face. She says, there are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ and who really desire to be children of God, yet they realize that their character is imperfect, their life faulty, and they're ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. To such, I would say, do not draw back in despair. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and our mistakes, but we're not to be what? Discouraged. Even if we're overcome by the enemy, we're what? Not cast off. Because we're in a relationship with the God of the universe. He knows our heart. He knows where we are. He knows that we love him. We want to follow him. He knows that we're weak and that sometimes we're going to fail. But that doesn't change how he looks at us. Not forsaken. Not rejected of God. No. No. Christ is at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Said the beloved John, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Talk to God as your best friend. Talk to God as one who wants to get you into heaven any way you can. Now, he wants us to walk boldly into heaven with, with gold and silver, but if we have the hay and the stubble and we just squeeze in, he's still glad to get us in. Now, we don't want to go with that motivation. Well, go, how much can I not do so I can still make it in? <laughs> don't misunderstand me on that. 
But what I'm saying is some of us are going to have, you know, I was taught you're going to have crowns, stars in your crown because of the people you've won. They're going to people, there were no stars in their crown if we use that imagery. But they're not going to feel any worse than any others. They're going to shout, hallelujah, I'm with Jesus. This life was nothing. I'm so glad that I'm there. And so to summarize, and I've taken too long, just as spiritual babies grow and mature, and some may be retarded, but we still love them. They're still members of the human race from the day they were conceived to be born till they die. They are human beings. When a person is born again, when they give their life to Jesus, they start as a baby, but they're part of God's family until they die or until they reject him, totally reject him, saying, God, I don't want you there because they're in a right relationship with the God of the universe. And God isn't going to keep us out because we didn't do the good that we should have done. He isn't going to keep us out because of all this long list of sins. He's going to take us right in because the blood of Jesus has cleansed us. The blood of Jesus washes us clean. And yes, as we conquer sin, God reveals new sins. And some we struggle with. Let's say one of those in that list, some immorality, and we say, yeah, Lord, I don't want to be immoral. And then we're coming to church and the we're killed in the car and we haven't overcome that yet. Will we make it to heaven? Yes. Because God isn't judging us based upon those acts. He's judging us where the heart is. And he knows that some of us struggle and struggle and struggle. Not because we want to be that way, but because for whatever reasons, our heritage, we know that that behavior is not right, but our will and our wish is to change it. And sometimes God changes it in an instant. And sometimes it can take months and years. The bottom line I want to leave with you, and I'm going to make a call at the benediction time to come to the prayer warriors. If some of you want to learn more about this and say, God, how can I feel secure? How can I stop trying to make myself secure and have God make me secure? Come and meet with the prayer warriors, and uh, if need be, they'll take your name down, and I can talk with you and some of the other pastors, because I don't want anyone to leave today with any doubt in their mind of their security before the God of the universe who loved us so much that he died and gave his life that we might be free. In his name, amen.